Good evening and welcome to Know Before You Grow, a subcommittee of Petaluma Urban Chat. I'm Dan Like, and as always, many, many thanks to Dave Alden and Sharon Kirk for doing the heavy lifting. I am uh, recovering from COVID, so you'll pardon me if I go off on a huge coughing spree occasionally. I'll try not to have that on mic. Uh, a couple upcoming events we wanted to mention. Tomorrow we're doing on an odd uh, Thursday, uh, lunch at Aquas, mostly to plan around the Chuck Marone visit. But if you'd like to come out, we uh, always are happy to see more into new faces. That's at noon at Aquas. Next week on Wednesday, June 15th, we're just about ca at capacity for the uh, Chuck Marone visit. So if you wanted to, please, uh, please sign up. We will probably have some standing room only spots available, but we have only got uh, 100 chairs, which are going to have a decent view. So uh, please sign up before that. Uh, June 29th, we have a tentative bringing neighborhood retail to Petaluma talk. And on July 13th, uh, Skinnell Properties is going to talk about their Hopper Street project, the 500 Hopper uh, property down there where there's currently uh, lots of big open uh, concrete slabs. Um, and then somewhere as a follow on to the transit or, or to the Chuck Marone visit next week, we're going to have a uh, TOD event, transit oriented development. And I uh, believe we have Dana Belzer of Strategic Economics of Berkeley confirmed for that. Uh, we're working on a date and expect early August, but we do not have a specific for that. And we'll be working around the SDAT dates, which we'll be talking around tonight. Um, I believe that's all we've got in terms of announcements. And uh, the usual, if people aren't talking and come back, all right, sorry. If, if people you expect to be talking aren't talking, remember that we, uh, the Brown Act is a thing and elected and appointed officials probably are taking that into consideration. And with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dave Alden, who is going to introduce this evening's uh, festivities. Dave, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dan. Hey, and by the way, I always appreciate what you do. You, you do a great job with this. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the upcoming SDAT event. Uh, just to get the acronyms out of the way, uh, SDAT is the Sustainable Design Assistance Team. It is a effort of the American Institute of Architects, so A AIA, SDAT, AIA, SDAT, all sorts of different ways we describe them. Uh, Veronica can tell you how it is we came to secure an SDAT effort, which was a major effort that she helped head up. But there was a committee that was involved, and it, it was truly maybe not a cast of thousands, but it felt like that at times. A lot of people who wandered in, helped for a while, maybe didn't have the time to continue, but everybody's assistance was valuable. Right now, we are down to a organizing team of roughly eight people who are putting this together for early August, doing the, the local organizing. Those forks are, well, we're, we'll start with Natasha, who I think here is somewhere on the screen. There, there she is. Um, two weeks ago, we had a extended meeting, long range planning meeting in her garage. So tonight she is joining us from her garage. So uh, the council member, Delinda Fisher, uh, I forget, is, is vice mayor correct or is that, that's post okay now? Yeah. I can never keep track, I'm sorry. Council member, Glenda Fisher, an early player in this effort also. Uh, Pete Gang, who I don't believe is here, uh, played a role all the way through. And Edminster, again, somebody, oh, excuse me, Ann is there. Um, was a, a, has been a, a good solid addition. Mary Dooley, who told us she's watching the Warriors game, but many of you know her for her architectural work. And then Larry Reed has recently joined the team. Uh, I don't know how, how many of you know Larry, but uh, long, distinguished career as a landscape architect, recently retired. Uh, I'm part of the team. And then number eight, the leader, the person speaking tonight, the one without whom it wouldn't have come together, Veronica Olson. Veronica, the show is yours. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'd like to just say that um, I was joined by uh, Natasha, Juliana, and Delinda at the beginning. And if it weren't for the two of them, um, the stat would not have happened either because I was new to Petaluma. 
So thank you for, for those introductions <clears throat> and how we actually got the Sustainable Design Assessment Team American Institute of Architects grant was I was um, kind of looking at climate change. How, how are we going to deal with all these big problems? And some of the things that were happening um, in terms of development, uh, I was just looking at how could we create a vision as a community that would be in, in alignment with our goals. Um, so that was the initial kind of um, response to the grant. And we were successful with the grant with the application called Our Regenerative Rivertown, which uh, we were going to have a specific project around. And then COVID happened. And then the general plan process overtook the, um, or handle the visioning process. Uh, so here we are in 2022 and our grant is, is up and running. And we have decided through our focus of the general plan vision, uh, we came together in late March with the AIA and city stakeholders to um, come up with the 15 minute neighborhood and living streets. So that is the area of our focus. And um, so then we went to, um, oh, I guess I should start my presentation. Wait a minute, let me just get that up. Okay, a second. I don't know why I did that. Okay, oops, sorry. We uh, shouldn't okay. have gotten quite so far in the pre-show. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah. So what what we are going to talk about tonight is our SDAP um, and and what 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 does that mean for us in Petaluma? Basically, we're we're trying to figure out how can we create. Um, a 15 minute city, which is a place where you can you can find all that you need in a 15 minute walk or bike ride. So we've talked in our in our general plan vision that we want convenient access to healthy and local food, that we want an inclusive community, that we want support for our local businesses, and that we want our infrastructure and facilities to be sustainably financed and that we want distinct neighborhoods where we can live, work, and play. And we want active and animated communities. And we want our, our, our neighborhoods to be friendly and beautiful and nature-filled, and that it's safe and easy for us to travel across town um, on, on foot, on bike, electric and hybrid transport, and that we have adopted a climate change community-driven whole systems and nature-based approach to development. So with that vision, um, we have also done a lot of things that have contributed to that same spirit. And things like Cool City Petaluma, the ESTAT, um, the Climate Action Commission, the, um, uh, the blue zones that are that are being um, talked about right now. There's there's really been a tremendous amount of energy that has been put together by the community, by city staff, and by um, electeds on how we can become a sustainable city and a regenerative city. We have some background though from our past <laughs> that that is very difficult in in some of our bigger problems, and that is sprawl, our car culture, our climate crisis, and biodiversity loss. So we have these great visions, and now we have to figure out how are we going to solve the problems um, <clears throat> in a more practical way. So from 1960 to 2010, urbanization grew one and a half, I mean, 1.7 times faster than the population. And the reason why we have so many roads and so many cars is because of this paradigm. And there was a focus on how we are moving cars rather than how we're planning for people. Um, and, and, and development was primarily 
this, which led to poor air quality, traffic congestion, unsafe streets, scarce tree canopies, box stores, loss of habitat, loss of wetlands, isolation, noise pollution, et cetera. Petaluma is also suffering from some of this. 67% of our GHG emissions are from transportation. 44% of our land is low density residential. And the number one cause of death is road crashes. And 33% of our car trips are less than two miles. And 73% are solo. So a city is where people live and they call it home and where you go. And, and it also defines where we go and how you get there and how you spend your time. So what if a city was structured differently where people traveled differently, had more places to meet, had access to localized goods and services? Accessibility is a huge part of this. How can we get two things and four things and to be in our city, not in the car. How can we get to places to gather, to meet friends, to buy things that we need? We're at a unique time in, in our history. We're doing the general plan and we are also at a, at a, a, a heightened, um, crisis for, for climate change. So this AIA grant is an opportunity for us to really shape our future, to actually rethink how we're going to plan our city, how we're going to plan our neighborhood, our community spaces, but it will require a new lens, completely rethinking the way that we move around the city and the way that we build our neighborhoods and the way that we build our apartments and so forth. And designing for people in nature is, is one of the main um, things that has been left out. We've, we've been focused on the built environment and it is time to now balance our entire focus and, and look at how is nature and the relationship between nature and people. The AIA SDAT focus on the 15 minute um, neighborhood and living streets will require huge community engagement effort and a user centric design process. There will be five to seven national experts coming to lead the vision and design process for the 15 minute neighborhood and living streets subject matter. On Friday, August 5th, there will be community engagement there will be an AIA city tour, stakeholder meetings, community event surveys, and Zoom meeting option. In this process, we will be coming together as a community to imagine what can Petaluma neighborhoods and streets look like in our future. On Monday, August 8th, the AIA team presentation to the community and stakeholders will happen on a special city council meeting. So the main emphasis for this project is to create a vision for our 15 minute neighborhood, which is how do we find everything we need in a 15 minute bike or, or walk, and then creating a strategy and then the policy and policy zoning and actions that go along with that, including a short and long long term project goals metrics and also the most important thing is how do we integrate the things that we find out in within our general plan our active transportation plan and our climate action plans. So the 15 minute neighborhood and living streets. What is it. Paris is doing it. Um, there, the person who came up with the concept is a professor at the Sorbonne, and he talks about intensification, localization, and proximity. So that means oh, the, these are some of the other cities that have also taken on this this land use planning. 
Paris, Portland, Cleveland, Boulder, Seattle, Vancouver, Ottawa, Bogota, and Melbourne. So the 15 minute neighborhood is a place where residents of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities in all parts of the city are able to ask, access their daily need, needs within a 15 minute walk or bike ride. So can you think about for yourself, how many things can you do? Um, can you get a loaf of bread? Can you go to the doctor? Can you have your, do your children walk to school? What can you do in your neighborhood? So a 15 minute neighborhood includes neighborhood housing, work, food, education, health, culture, art, design, and leisure. It includes mixed use with a diverse housing option, with diverse housing options designed for people and nature to thrive together. Living streets are safe, they're slow, they're green, they're cool, and they're designed for people and nature in mind. So things like bump outs and trees and greenery included. Uh, slowing traffic down, 20 is plenty. Looking at how we can make the streets themselves public spaces. What can we do to make it so that people want to get on their bikes, want to sit and visit with their friends, want to chat, want to pick up their children from school? Here are some examples of some um, quick build people living in the streets. The street becomes the public space. So our connected places, <clears throat> our access to affordable transit options and bicycle and pedestrian and infrastructure is another key piece to the 15 minute neighborhood. Um, Also looking at new ways of transportation, not only, trans, not only transit options, but um, looking at how small businesses can take over um, new ways of getting people around. This is actually from um, Helsinki. They use this as one of their um, ways, public transport options. So neighborhood retail, restaurants, and community spaces are designed for people and nature. So you have a neighborhood cafe, locally owned neighborhood stores, places to rest. When you come, when you're doing your shopping, you have a place to sit and have a chat. And this was um, a, a quick build project. So you can see, um, that they've taken this, the parking spaces and made it into a little park. Repurposing your parking lots. This is a food truck uh, park, I guess they call it. Um, these are things that we could be doing with some of our parking lots and create vibrant community spaces. Neighborhood parks and parklets and open spaces. from parking lots to gardens. Okay, so the one on the left is kind of uninspiring. <laughs> and then we have the transformation. So it's, it's using the community to get involved in greening the spaces. So not leaving it up to someone. Neighborhood schools and community education. Our children walk to school ride their bikes, neighborhood gardens and access to healthy food. So the benefits of a 15 minute neighborhood construct is that we will benefit in health and quality of life. It'll be better for our climate goals, better for nature. It's more inclusive, it's more equitable, and it's great to develop our local economy. So, how do we implement such a thing? Because we have this single family home zoning, we have um, 
a focus on the car. We have a lot of speeding, um, some of the things we've mentioned before um, in a lot of the different discussions in Know Before You Grow. So how do we, how do we actually do this? One of the things is to look at adaptive reuse, multi-use and flexibility. So something that becomes, um, there, there's like a 24 hour use of things. So a gym becomes a gym by day and then it becomes um, a community center by night or um, a storefront becomes a place where people play chess in the evening. So that, that community spaces become this focus and flexibility also in terms of um, how things are zoned. So that would include also um, work live options. So essentially the rhythm of the city follows people, not cars in this, in this 15 minute neighborhood and all the, space should, all the spaces should should have many purposes at different hours. And neighborhoods are designed to live and work without having to commute somewhere. And Bruce Mao is, is a designer that um, talks about cities, that cities are not built environments and roads. They are what happens between people, life, home, information, and nature. They are the platforms for innovation and collective action. We need to design outcomes by asking how we work together. Neighborhood systems, food systems, biodiversity, climate change, livability and collaboration. Systems need to be thought about holistically. Design is about envisioning and doing. So join us for the Petaluma Estat Sustainable Design Assessment Team. Um, on August 5th for the community engagement and on August 8th for the presentation. We hope that we can really create a vision for what 15 minute neighborhood means to Petalumans and also what living streets mean to Petalumans and then have those visions implemented into our general plan and a few projects, you know, uh, tangible outcomes and metrics from this process. Thank you. So I haven't seen any comments on the chat yet. Um, I do see one applause hand, but uh, can you on the fifth and the eighth, can you give us times please so that I can put these in my calendar right now? Um, that let's see. Too much? Um, well, I would say after, I can definitely say after 12 <laughs> on the 5th. Um, no, it will probably be from, from four o'clock onward. Um, there might be a, a, a larger community event. And then depending on, um, there are different, different stakeholders that are going to also be interviewed by the, by the American Institute of Architects team. So, if you're in the Know Before You Grow group, then you might also have another meeting, so. Okay. Um, I'll just generically block those out for now and we'll uh, put that forward. And you had asked me uh, earlier to queue up a video. Would you like to show, like me to show that? Yeah. Or, um, or do you wanna do questions first and then, and then maybe we can show the video after? Well, I haven't seen any questions yet. Um, and ex the only question I've got is Dave asking, did I miss the videos? So uh, maybe we should do the video now and then we can have conversation and discussion. Okay. And, okay. Okay. and I also forgot to mention in the introduction, um, please uh, drop questions in the chat and we'll have that, or I will kind of coalesce them and bring them up and yeah, we'll have further conversation. But I think there are 10 minutes and two seconds of a video. So let me uh, do that video. Um, share screen, here we go. And uh, sorry, that ran just slightly longer than Veronica asked me to because my timer was set a little bit slow. Um, but let's pop back over and uh, converse now. And I think you're muted, Veronica. Oh, no, I'm okay. here. Yeah. 
So uh, yeah, let's let's have a little conversation. We start with uh, Jerry, who said roughly estimating 15 minutes to walk is about one mile. Petaluma is roughly six miles long. Are we assuming six focal points or something else? And one of the things that I've long heard is that a grocery store requires between eight and 10,000 people to, to function. And we have largely kind of clustered them close together, but petaluma has got about 60,000 people. They've got about seven grocery stores. It's been a while since I added them up. Um, seems like, I don't know, they're, yeah, how, how do you see the kind of the clustering of commercial centers working or do you have a vision for that? Um, well, maybe I, I can I can try to answer that. Um, sure. I think what we're talking about is localizing um, our areas and our neighborhoods with local food um, choices as well. So um, we have, you know, a place where you could go with your basics, maybe for a longer ride, but then you would have the things you need daily closer to your home. Um, so with the advent of um, electric bikes with some carriers and so forth and, and more people on different types of modes of transport that we wouldn't have everyone driving to the same place. That would be the vision. If we're talking about, I mean, a lot of these conversations we're, we're looking at the general plan, we're looking at how we're going to influence our future. So, um, we can hardly think about the future in the same way. So um, I actually have a quote about that from Bruce Mao, and he says, uh, when, when the outcome drives the process, we will only ever go to where we have already been. If the process drives the outcome, we may not know where we're going, but we know we wanna be there. Mm. Cool. So I think I that's think a great we question too. Don't, Okay. Sorry, go ahead. I'm gonna chime in for you, Veronica. No, uh, I also think that scale is an interesting question there, like just for the grocery store question. Uh, for example, I've lived in towns where there were, it seemed like there were corner stores everywhere so that no matter where you lived, you could get, you know, milk, beer, coffee, like some basics within like three blocks. And Petaluma doesn't really seem to have that um, type of, of makeup. So, you know, the type of grocery store we might think of, at, you know, Petaluma Market or Whole Foods or Safeway or something like that. There's also like a, a smaller scale version that might help uh, fit some other needs. Um, so, and I think that question came up the other day too, I think Veronica about like how many neighborhoods are we talking about? Um, and for this purpose, we're really asking the community to start investigating that. Like, where do you live? What things do you need around you? What would you like to see around you? Um, where are there already nodes that are sort of developed, but not very walkable? And, and then the community can start to create that and create more of a neighborhood sense. When we've been doing this, the other interesting thing that keeps coming up is Petaluma for being um, a city of this size doesn't have very many neighborhoods with identities. When people ask you where you live, people who live in Oak Hill know where they live, you know? But like, if you think about it, a lot of people don't have like a sense of identity of where they live or, a, uh, and so how do we start to create those little pocket identities as well so that you can have pride and, and um, a sense of, of place in whatever neighborhood you're already in. If I could chime in also, I mean, one, I agree with what you just said, Natasha, it's absolutely dead on. And it's not a matter for the ESTAT process or the city to decide where nodes are going to be. I, I think our job is to create, plow a field where, where nodes can occur and then watch and see how people respond to them. It's going to be a matter of private capital going hey, everybody's on an electric bike in this part of town. I can put a small grocery store in here and make it work. So we're just trying to create the windows where people can see that path to that future. And that's the exciting stuff with all the, uh, the quick build ideas that, that people are experimenting with across the country and, and the world, I'm sure. But like the idea of testing out ideas too, you know, how can you test out a neighborhood? What would it feel like to have a coffee shop here? Can you have a pop-up coffee shop to see... Uh, 
you know, do people come out and are people excited about it? And, yeah. and then that would give a new small business um, the, the motivation incentive to, to try that out. Somebody's got their hand raised there. Uh, that would be Eris. Mm -hmm. Eris, lay it on us. <laughs> well, just something that, that, that's been bonking around my mind and thinking about this is like, what, okay, what can we do, you know, from a city standpoint, right? We can change infrastructure. We can change zoning laws about what can and can't be built or what, you know, and stuff. But a challenge that I actually had to work with around how do you um bring in the kind of businesses in a neighborhood that you want to see i i live in a, a mixed use community in katati and i used to manage our um commercial uh, part of our property and we had spent so many hours talking about what kind of businesses do we want to see here what does the downtown what does our neighborhood need what would we want to patronize what are good uses in this shared building that had apartments above the store spaces but then the reality that hit when we were trying to you know as we've continued to lease the space is what we think we want is not necessarily what you know, people who are trying to start businesses are wanting to do or, or seeing the location as viable for it. So there's this um, little, little weird disconnect there that so many of the things we wanted never happened. And several of the things that are there are things that people were not real thrilled at. At one point we had like three different beauty salons you know in the building <laughs> which was you know not something any you know one was nails and one was hair or whatever <clears throat> um which was not what any of us had thought was the biggest need in our downtown neighborhood but it's who was looking for space when we had a space open and you know all that kind of stuff i will say the one upside to more service-based industries like that is that it helps with our consumption-based emissions, right? Rather than asking people to keep buying more stuff, it's gonna be an interesting, to me, this is super fascinating. Like how do we transform our downtowns? Like what happens when we stop buying stuff? Because part of the climate challenge is that we need to really, you know, our, our whole economic system is based around consumption and our downtowns are about shopping in a lot of places, right? And that makes it an, an interesting walk because you get to look at the windows and all that kind of thing. And so it's going to be super interesting to reimagine what does a downtown, what does a vibrant downtown look like if we're not buying stuff anymore? You know, or if we're buying a lot less stuff if it's if it's mostly food and real necessities and not and you know extra things that the planet can't handle. So that's a good little mind. Um, you know, game to play you know, for me anyway. I, I think what might fun. gathering spaces look like that aren't centered around goods? Retail, yeah. 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 Well, I, I do that down to, in our downtown. I love walking and looking at the windows, but I don't, I have to say there are a lot of businesses I've be, been sad to see leave, but I, I'll admit that I never bought anything from them because I don't really, I'm always just trying to get rid of stuff. I don't really need any more stuff. So it's an interesting dilemma, right? Yeah. Well, it's, then you have the bicycle repair shops and the places that you can take your things to get repaired and use and trade. And, you know, we have a lot of, you know, used clothing stores and you know, that sort of thing in our city, which is interesting. I love that. that al almost all my stuff is. <laughs> the and then one of the other things um, too to note is the fact that um, we have the, our perception is that we have to go to the big grocery stores to buy food, but in essence, we don't actually because we live in it. If we if we started having more people buy from, well, the local supply is currently not enough. If we all decided to buy from the current the local supply, but if we if we developed and diversified some of our farming in the area, then we would be able to kind of live in this self-sustaining area. So we would have the, you know, an hour or two hour radius that we could get our food from. And that would just completely dissolve any need to transport goods and so forth, because we would just be 
living with seasonally available food. Um, so that's that's another thing that people can do to work with climate change is to actually make a commitment to buying local and providing um, opportunity for local businesses to thrive by supporting them. I read a book some years back called The 100 Mile Diet by a couple of Canadian couple that uh, lived for a year, decided to only eat things that had been grown um, within 100 miles of where they lived and found it really interesting. And so I embarked on a similar plan myself. And what was interesting was, you know, I mean, I learned new foods I'd never heard of before or never eaten because I was shopping at the farmer's market. Um, I had to bake all my own bread and I can only find one farm within 100 miles that uh, grew wheat, you know, where I could that I could source flour from. And it meant no coffee, no tea, no sugar, no chocolate. Um, so it was an, an interesting exercise uh, to, to really try and do that and, and only eat things that were, you know, within within a, a local thing. But, you know, he, I ate really good because we've got a lot of good stuff around here, but there were were things that are not uh, not not doable. So Aaron, oh, has, what? I was going to say, could we adopt a sister city in Columbia? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way around it. Yeah. So uh, Aaron tossed a question in here about how do we the how do we get there part, and I think that because a good portion of my uh, current email inbox is Safe Streets Petaluma Coalition traffic, um, anybody want to talk a little bit about the the first steps? Well, that's going to be that's going to be the exciting thing about the SDAP part too is that the AIA actually leaves us. They, they leave us with a presentation on that Monday, but they also spend a couple of months creating a document that they give to us as part of this grant that lays out next steps and, uh, and, and priorities and, uh, you know, what, what should we do first? What do we do second? Um, so they will actually be helping us devise that plan. One of the things I know that's been going around in our circles too, um, which is fun ideas around the quick build stuff and the like being able to test things, you know, that's a, that's a nice way to, um, to be able to see what it would be like to, I, I loved in the video, Veronica, I hadn't seen that video. That was a great video. I loved how they said it wasn't the street street closed. It was a street opened for cars and bikes and people, you know, like I saw Aaron's comment also about the Washington street, which I love that, I mean, I'm always talking about like, what if Washington was this like amazing boulevard with like community gardens and, and bandstands and, and people playing chess and basketball and bikes. And I kind of have this thing for electric golf carts because not everyone can get around, you know, with their three kids and groceries on a, on a bike, um, you know, and, and electric golf carts and like you could reimagine and, and what if, instead of saying it was closed for the weekend, we were really gonna open it to all of these other activities and see what was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we will get some really great concrete next steps from the AIA, which is exciting. Right, and then also I think we get um, <clears throat> the ideas that everyone has, the part of the process is, you know, imagining. So thinking of if, you know, if you woke up tomorrow and we had this bikeable, walkable, um, with a diverse use of housing, diverse mix of housing and opportunity for people to be in community spaces and all the things that we, you know, saw in the presentation and things that we have in our vision, how, what, what would it, what would it feel like? Because I think we, we actually also have to get out of our, our own construct, you know, and start really thinking about what could you do if things were different. So I, uh... One of the things that I wanted to toss in here because I saw that Tim asked about the sources of inspiration. He didn't phrase it like that. Uh, he asked what city has adopted the most recommendations, what are the key factors to implement those? But uh, Veronica has a bunch of videos that she had put together that uh, I guess we will probably distribute via the uh, Petaluma Urban Chat page. And uh, we'll try to get that going there. 
I, and we are also looking, we're going to be shortly here somehow building our, uh, a website for this project too, which we hope to have great inspiration pages. But thank you for to Urban Chat for helping us disseminate that information. Yes, thank you. I noticed that uh, Jerry has his hand up and then uh, Dwayne, but did I inter interrupt somebody there? Jerry, go for it. Yes, thank you. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I want to draw your attention to what I put into the chat, which was uh, this book that I would highly recommend called Stolen Focus. Um, and the premise has a lot to do with um, how the technology companies deliberately stole our focus and, and the, the engagement algorithms that are used take our focus away. But the late, in the later part of that, he has a whole chapter on children and how children's ability to play freely and by themselves basically is really different today than it's ever been. And that's hurting children, uh, their creativity and their focus. So I want to be sure as we add this part in that we you know, always have this segment for, for the children and the elders, usually together, but. Uh. Thank you, that's very cool. Yeah, I thought that was really, um... I, I liked how they highlighted that in the video, Veronica, that we forget that streets used to be places where people, kids would play. Um, my, yeah, you know, and that they were safe places to play and that that's not so much so true anymore, but it could be again. Dwayne has his hands up, hand up too. Yes, I, I would point it uh, following that last uh, mention. I, I would uh, suggest that uh, certain areas of Santa Rosa have um, uh, small markets uh, every few blocks and in the old sections built in the 20s and 30s. And the children would be sent to the store to buy uh, necessities. And that all ended basically with the abolition of the fair trade laws. I would point out that if we're looking at, um, if we're looking at uh, Europe as a model, we should be uh, keeping in mind that the Europeans have been used to paying uh, $6 plus a gallon um, for decades with like four dollars of it going for tax and until merchants uh, understand that we would be doing the same and going to uh, one car families instead of two car families and that, uh, that during the day uh, people would want to walk to the store until the merchants honestly believe that they won't be opening up stores like they did in the uh, 20s and 30s i think it's worth pointing out too that in that four dollars a gallon of tax um, that's still not coming really close to covering the costs, the social costs of the automobile. And uh, we're also going to have a problem. We need to be moving away from car centered things because as much as we like electric automobiles and I have one and I love it, um, they have many of the same problems as gas powered automobiles in terms of 28% of the microplastics in the ocean are tire dust. I, 40,000 people a year are killed in automobile collisions. Um, and we have to kind of address all of those things. Um, oh, and Mary- yeah, and moving, is, moving to electric cars doesn't get you out of the traffic jam and all the time wasted. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, so two things here on, on history. Uh, there's a question about what is G&G &G, and I had forgot the G&G &G market is where the far, um, the furthest away from me Safeway is, that used to be G&G &G Market over there, kind of on the Northeast side. And uh, Lisa Marie mentioned Tuttles and I think Tuttles is before my time. Can anybody fill me in on what Tuttles was? Lisa Marie, you wanna help us out? It was <laughs> apparently a West Side store of some sort, but I only store on Western, yeah. Okay, here we go. West Side Stories. Um, yeah, so Tuttle's Market is um, is um, now behind the big parking lot across from Petaluma Market. And I think that was one of the things that definitely contributed to killing it. Um, and then we also got the big um, Long's Drugs, which is now CVS, and that just finished it off. It was, it was locally owned. Tuttle, um, that's uh, Patricia Tuttle Brown. That was her grandfather who owned it. And um, so it had been several generations, you know, a couple of generations had, um, you know, gone by and um, you could go there and you could buy glue, you could buy paper, you could buy 
some few little food items. Um, every little knickknack was in the, you know, every crazy corner of that crazy store. Um, <clears throat> but when we lost that, uh, then we had to cross Washington Street to get to a drugstore. There also was a small, um, uh, like Rexall hardware down maybe where that pizza place is next to near McNear's and um, the sushi place. There was a, a very old uh, um, pharmacy there. But Rex, um, uh, Tuttle's was more of sundries and all kinds of, all kinds of things. So between Petaluma Market, which at that time was early days was Food City and Rex Hardware, you had everything you needed. I, I, cool. can, I can say even in the what 15 years I've lived here, I, I'm guessing it's because of Amazon, there's been a change in how easy it is to access certain things. Like I was downtown, like there used to be like a, a oh, office supplies it. and paper supplies, that little store downtown there, uh, there, yeah. And there were, there were all these little, I was realizing the other day, I was trying to do a bunch of stuff, errands on foot. And I was like, there's just zero places to go to get in certain types of things. Um, and, and they've all, a lot of those little stores have disappeared probably because of, you know, people just buying things on Amazon or the big box stores coming in. And, but now you have to get on in your car and drive across town to the big box store to get, you know, office supplies, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, um, in the oh, chat. Shutterbug, yeah, I remember Shutterbug. Mm -hmm, that, yeah, people are putting in thing, I, things that used to be there, sorry. Yeah, uh, John asked, would it help? <laughs> are there traffic uh, changes that we can make? And one of the things that I just had a t-shirt made up that uh, says uh, traffic, somebody's unmuted and I can't figure out who it is. Dwayne, I think. Okay, I'll get him. Um, I just had a, uh, a t-shirt made up that says traffic congestion drives positive outcomes because as long as gas is as cheap as it is and as long as we subsidize the automobile as heavily as we do and it, it's really at least 50 cents a mile and probably closing in on a dollar a mile that we we pay for every mile that people travel in an automobile the only cost that people pay for driving is the time they spend in traffic and if we can simply move more people by bike, by pedestrian, by even lightweight electric vehicles, e-bikes and e-trikes and mobility scooters, um, then we will both move more people who need to get places and there will be less space for cars and that the cost of driving will go up and people will find alternatives. Isn't that true, Dan, that they do those studies where no matter how many lanes you add, the congestion just fills them up because it becomes more convenient to drive because there's you know, less, you know, there's less traffic. And so then it just always goes back to the same. Exactly. Uh, and people baseline. always commute. I forget what the constant is, but there's a somebody's constant, which is people always commute about 22 minutes. And if they <laughs> commute, if if you open up another freeway lane the house they'll move further away from their jobs to get further away so yes it, it, it's called marchetti's constant thank you i figured somebody would know and one of the things i i hope veronica puts those where we get those videos because as i have become more involved in the community of people looking at urbanism i was walking down the middle of mission drive the other day and realized there is a 50 foot wide right of way there if we had a reasonable sized Woonerf, that is a road which has shared pedestrian bicycle traffic and is designed to prioritize, but we could put a whole nother freaking row of houses down the middle. <laughs> and, and some of these uh, developments that are built that way in, in Europe, even in some places in the US are wonderful spaces. Um, so we have tons of room for infill. I, I'm going to go around town now imagining rows of infill like down the middle of certain big abandoned streets. Yes, thanks for that. I, I've started to carry a, a, a tape measure on my bicycle on the street gang and we go around measure lane widths. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we know that sounds very bike nerd, but <laughs> I'm glad you guys are doing it. Okay. I, I have a question or not a question, a comment about um, the the notion that we're we're so we're, we're almost like psychologically um, like kind of what he was saying in the video, like we're just we're 
we have this construct that we just work from that it's okay to have such so many roads and so many streets and the widths and so forth and to to actually just get our minds to think about what the street and our neighborhoods could look like where they have where we have this is just i mean i think if we start doing it one block at a time or one neighborhood at a time we're going to find that um Chuck Marone, I was reading something that he said, don't overthink the 15 minute neighborhood because once you get some of the things in place that the community will also step up and, um, and create a lot of their initiatives. Yes, I think that there are a lot of, we can paint one intersection and start there and see if that works and see how that changes our neighborhoods. And there's this sort of spiral between the infrastructure and, and behavioral stuff. I mean, one of the things that I see is I'm both trying to encourage people to ride bikes and encourage, you know, cities to create better infrastructure is, you know, people say, well, I can't ride until it's safe. Well, until it's safe, people aren't riding and then people don't see the need. Well, we gave you a bike line and nobody, nobody rides in it. And so um, it's like, I love the rides that people are, are, are doing. Like, you know, I, I go to Taco Tuesday in Santa Rosa uh, regularly and some of the rides that Bike um, Petaluma is doing because people have gotten, we need to start taking the space and not just wait for it to be fixed for us because the more visible that we are in the street, whether we're walking or on bikes, then the more people go like, oh, okay, people are doing this. You know, I grew up in LA and all the kids rode and, and bikes, to, you know, biked and walked to school and everybody knew that this, you know, that there'd be a lot of kids at a certain time. And now, no, you know, fewer people do it so people aren't used to seeing it. So I think any of these activities, whether we're creating a, um, a uh, bike train, you know, a group of kids riding to school together or going on these bigger group rides of just starting to reclaim some of, you know, the, the um, dance between, you know, individual action and, you know, pushing for infrastructure change and, and all of that, that we have to weave all of those parts together. Hey, uh, this is a Perfect segue. Delinda, do you want to give a plug for your, the first Friday at five? <laughs> <laughs> the first Friday of the month at 5 p.m. Walnut Park, we do go out and take over the streets and people notice and they're usually pretty nice about it. A line I heard recently is that we don't decide where to build bridges based on the number of people swimming across a river. <laughs> on the other hand, I would say that anybody walking across D Street, where I routinely have people blow through the crosswalk, or Washington, where I routinely see I have to dodge cars every time I cross in the crosswalk with the cross signal at, at the Kentucky, or anybody bicycling anywhere in the city is swimming across the river. I watched that today, Dan. I was dri driving in my electric car, but still driving across um, at at um, uh, uh, um, not Caulfield, but the other one, which I was Corona. Corona. I don't know why I get that mixed up. Anyway, and I saw somebody on their bike, they were riding up to the bridge and th that bridge has no bike lane, it's very narrow and it has a sidewalk that's like a foot and a half up off the ground. He had to get off his bike, put his bike up onto the sidewalk. He was trying to get back on his bike, on, you know, and ride on this little narrow sidewalk. And I was thinking, this is just dangerous and ridiculous. So I, yeah. that's why there's a ghost bike there. He was trying to swim across the river there. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that in terms of prioritization, the South Point uh, multi-use path, the one that is supposed, supposed to connect to the South Point Road and go into the freeway was closed because Caltrans said it was going to cost an additional million and a half dollars to keep open during construction. And we should note that one person was killed, has already been killed on the Corona overpass during that period. If you take the statistical value of a life at $10 million, not to reduce human life to money or anything. That means that we have, by not keeping the South Point Road open, we as a society have lost that much, the human life and the equivalent money. And that's, yeah, that's a real, a real cost that we are paying for another lane on 101 that will be filled up almost immediately. 
Great point. Yeah. I have, I, I saw that John Tripps had a question. I don't know if it was answered, pardon me if it was, but um, he says, how many corner stores will be needed to change? No, how many corners will be needed to change to stores and parks and quick stops for basic needs in the east side? That's and even the west side, even the west side, if you think about it too, like other than like Ray's, I mean, there's a, but yes, the east side is very glaring. Good and a story that I tell on this front is I live a, a, a house off of Mountain View. When I moved into this house, which was built in 42, we think, um, there was an Electrolux vacuum cleaner in it. And it had the address of a service center on in the 700 block of Mountain View. So somebody was running a vacuum cleaner sales and service place out of their house on Mountain View. We have lost that. Yeah. Dwayne, do you want to talk about your concept of 50 minute city over on the east side that you're telling me, telling me about? Well, I, um, actually, I was going to comment on Corona overpass. I have seen possibly the same individual twice crossing that on a wheelchair. Oh, I thought gosh. Natasha would, would enjoy that vision. Oh, yeah, that even worse. Uh, no. I know. I was thinking when I saw that, I was at, like, at least they could put a ramp up to the sidewalk. And there, there you have it, they need a ramp. And the Linda, I'm, I'm not sure whether that's the appropriate topic here. I, I would always talk about trying to build a pedestrian orient, a real one uh, at the uh, Corona station uh, mm -hmm. rather than what, what's been planned. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know if this is the time. Um, uh, thank you for the <laughs> suggestion. Well, but it is interesting to go around the city with that sort of lens in mind and you start to look, I, I was noticing even, because I live near there, the uh, intersection of um, Payran and Petaluma Boulevard um, and how that, there are actually are a lot of homes within walking distance of that area, especially if that, that you know, with the north reach of the river there and those trails along that, um, it could be an easy, easy place to get to. But right now it's so car centric, but it could be a really great place to be. And I, when Acre was a coffee shop, it's amazing the draw of a coffee shop. It did give it kind of a little neighborhood feel. And now that it's pizza, it doesn't seem to have the same vibe to me, but it's interesting. I don't know, or I'm a tea drinker myself, but the, the coffee culture does create these great little nodes. Yes. John says lots of road roadblocks and issues. Where do we start? Well, that's what the SDAT project is, is there for us to, we're going to have seven, <clears throat> five or six or seven people coming in with um, a great amount of knowledge and everyday experience um, to solve these problems. So uh, hope, hope that this will be the beginning of a lot of implemented stuff. Yeah, and, and they've had a lot of experience with other cities, so they'll be able to, we'll be able to get that knowledge from them about what works, what they've seen work and not work. Big, big <laughs> trucks all over the city. <laughs> yeah. um, and come to the, well, so there, there's also the uh, Petaluma Safe Streets Coalition, or I, I, I get the order of those words wrong, but um, Safe Streets Petaluma uh, Coalition is working towards figuring out incremental ways to change an intersection at a time. Um, and uh, I'm sure that Chuck Marone will have a lot of insight and we are going to try to record the Chuck Marone uh, talk beyond the visit next, uh, next week. And if anybody has assistance on that, we would love to have a camera person. And if you've got gear, please hit me up. And Jerry's got his hand up again. No, thank you. Um, when we're talking about the markets, and I was trying to list all the ones I was thinking of, um, the other consideration is who owns those markets? At this point in the game, can we start talking to the actual owners to see what would be the dynamics of making them more so full service market? I think that the guy, whoever owns Bodega Market on the, on the very west end, uh, as well as the 7-Eleven across from Walnut Park, I think that's the same person, but I'm not sure. Uh, but in, in, ma in making the inventory, you know, the inventory of the existing retail space uh, would be useful to get those folks on board to, to test it out. 
Yeah, you know, that I saw something that, you, that one of those comments and it made me think in the back of my mind, I wonder if there's, this might seem weird, but like if there was a way to like pair those corner stores that don't have a lot of the, you know, good healthy food with a local CSA as a local CSA drop spot, like if there would be, if we could talk them into have, you know, creating that partnership and as a, as an entry into like fre fresh local produce and they might, it might start to change the way those corner stores, you know. Yeah, so the, I'm, that's what I'm talking about is, is building those relationships now by identifying those people and finding out what their self-interest is. Uh, and then having the idea, like you just mentioned, percolate up, that's, um, that's excellent in terms of a CSA distribution point. I know that South City Market for a while was trying to do produce, um, but in this neighborhood, having a couple of unripe tomatoes and some iceberg lettuce didn't really capture what local <laughs> tended to <do>. what, <laughs> what <we're>, Yeah. <laughs> but the CSA could be interesting because you have like this guarantee of a certain number of people coming in every week. And then maybe you start stocking a few other things that they might want. They pick and, up at the same time. Yeah, if, if we encourage, I, I, there are there is definitely room for synergy here. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we've kind of hit a a lull in the conversation. Have explored things out, um, and we've also gone for an hour and a quarter. Uh, does anybody have any final thoughts? And shall we call it after those? Veronica, Dave, anybody else? I think my only ask is um, if people are interested in participating in the process on August 5th, that you tell everyone you know, and that it is a community-wide event. Um, and we will, we will be communicating the specifics and the times and so forth. You'll be able to get that readily in, in, through the newsletter of the city and some other uh, communication channels, but please spread the word to, for people to save the date for August 5th. Excellent. And is it possible, Dan, for you, I think somebody asked earlier, I know you're going to send out a list of <coughs> videos, but is it possible for you to drop the link to the video that you showed into I, the chat so people can I have, watch the full thing tonight? I have put that in the chat. Okay, great. I have that off now. And I will also great. make sure Thank that you. we put the chat up with when I post the vi this video. Um, Great. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Know Before You Grow. And thank you, Dave, and all the team members and our community and our council people and our GPAC members and everyone who's just awesome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Veronica. Yeah, thanks, Veronica. Yeah. That was great. You guys have a fun night. Thank you. Dave, you've been trying to pop in there for a bit. No, I was just going to say that there are still four seats left for Marone next uh, Wednesday night. Anybody who wants those better get online right now and claim them. <laughs> and Got mine. <laughs> I'll see you there. I'm looking forward to it. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night, Good night all. <laughs>